And uh, assuming all judges and speakers are ready, without further ado, I call upon the first speaker of side position to deliver their speech. Cool. I prefer POIs verbally. Um, can you time this? Maybe can you time this? You Wait, I think you're unmuted. Okay, cool. Our bad. Sorry. No worries. Um, okay, I'm going to start in three, two, one. In a world that's overwhelmingly negative and hopeless on critical issues, positive political fiction can be a beacon of hope, never been prouder to propose. A few points are set up. First, this is a narrative motion. I, we think that political fiction is extremely powerful. It influences thought, ideology, and it's extremely important. But why is political fiction narrative setting? Why do people actually buy it? Number one, because it's fiction. They tend to make it ex exceptionally realistic. Meaning to say, characters are often based on real life rules and issues are often based on real life issues that people can relate to. But secondly, art has a huge now to say. People often internalize things that they watch on like TV shows, especially because they don't have any other avenues to refer to for referred to for like that's inside source of politics. They tend to make this a notion of government. This is unique as compared to the news or other forms of media where political news is direct and maybe not as entertaining and influential. But thirdly, we say that political politics here refers to like democratic issues. We're not talking about things that are entirely fictional, but with regards to the spirit of the motion, this, this takes place in like things like liberal democracies. But fourthly, positive fiction refers to fiction when change is possible, where people can get better outcomes. This usually looks like a bad beginning when people are in like a mess and certain protagonists make huge changes. This is either internal, like people within the office are brave and great and they make structural change and they change like corrupt structures, or this is external where there, where there's like revolutions. A new government is voted in, people taken in, in their own hands to change the way the government works. Either way, it sets the narrative that you are positive and optimistic and note but panel, there'll still be some like some level of like, negative fiction on our side as well. First argument then on how we get better political spheres. The yeah. for this argument is that when your image on the inside of the government is based on the art that you consume, the following manifests. If positivity is, positivity is displayed, you believe that people within the governments are good people that are willing to make change. It gives people the potential possibility of change and happiness. But it's important to note that in the status quo, the political views are kind of sad. The kinds of negative narratives that opposition will talk about already exist because people see huge issues, right? They see cultural divides in India. They see structural issues in places like the US in terms of like in terms of like prisons and things like that, right? And they see no reform. And there's far more voter action yeah. in the status quo because of things like the bystander effect where you lose faith in the ability for yourself to influence outcomes. Like we see media currently being extremely negative um, in the case of like climate change or like racism that are virulent in society. And we think the harsh reality of the status quo paired with negative TV shows inspires nihilism. Meaning to say people see that the governments are even worse than they thought they were. They internalize these worst images of the government and are therefore likely to go further into their rabbit holes on like nihilistic politics where they have no faith in the government. This is extremely harmful because number one, it means like less government scrutiny because people think that there's less they can do to change political outcomes. And in bad governments, it means that there's a risk of government cementing their power where fewer people vote. But secondly, it just means like less social progress on movements like, like Black Lives Matter or like climate change, which are seen to be less achievable at the point where people think that movements are unlikely to be like hopeful or likely to change, right? We prevent all these harms in three ways. First, we glorify politics. We show them that political systems, like these political systems in a positive light through these political fiction yeah. this is number one glorify views you're far more likely to be enthralled by things like voting elections and democratic processes these seem boring in the status quo and is further demonized on their side of the house when you feel that you can't make a change but secondly you have good realistic people playing politicians this tends to mitigate existing views or even trump them it instills that faith in people this is the same like effect as like the movie mary calm in like india bringing faith and attention to the sport of boxing in india it shows them that there's, it shows them in like a positive light, such as this. It can incite the same kind of impact, inspires hope. The impacts here is that people can actually think that their vote is far more meaningful when they realize that their vote is more likely to incite political change, given that fiction instills like these positive mindsets and less the kind of hopelessness that a status quo news bubble kind of brings. But secondly, we build optimism. We tell you that political fiction often places like a large focus on changing large systems that have been in place for a long time, right? These are large like, governmental systems. For example, um, like the negative media fiction, like the positive media fiction book, they may refer to like the right. transition from an autocratic controlling government to like a far more democratic one. This is not an easy like transition to for ordinary people to do. You're literally changing the way governments work. You're literally having to carry out protests, inciting revolution, things like that. This means that people who read these kinds of books are far more pessimistic about actually being able to achieve these political outcomes. But on the comparative, by virtue of being like positive and optimistic, you inspire people to act. You show success stories of where ordinary people like readers were able to create like a positive impact. They can see that they aren't 
just like a tiny drop in like a large ocean, but that there's a narrative that real change can take place as it stresses on the potential for positive outcomes. And um, note that opposition can't come and say this isn't realistic because we already disproved that in framing. The impacts here are massive, right? We want to nuance the impacts of these in accordance with like the different areas and actors in this debate. First, in areas that require huge delta, these are areas of where the government is like corrupt, where people have no faith. Positive, positive shows you the following things in these areas. Number one, we think that even if they, we don't get the delta in terms of social change in these places, it's still better to have positive, positive content because people require distractions from their troubles within these areas. A happy, fun image is far more likely to serve this cause than something that reminds them of their harsh reality. We think that art serves as a distraction on our side for these people as some sort of escape, but on their side, it reminds them of sorrow and instills further loathing of the systems around them. This is also likely to impact the way they view, they, they, the way they actually lead their lives, right? On an individual level, they're still worse off. But second, in areas where the government faith is relatively good, these are areas where like people see problems in the status quo, but they're not entirely like distraught and nihilistic. This is where we get definite Delta panel, because here, number one, you have more hope within existing social movements. You get more traction. But secondly, you have a more positive view on like actually your involvement in the system, right? You're far more likely to opt in and actually um, want to change the system. Before I move on to my third mechanism, I'll take a few more. For a white person in the US, when are they more likely to be alarmed into action? By watching Parks and Rec where everyone gets along smoothly and politicians are just inherently lovely, or in the king where for insulated people you see the harms of nepotism? We characterized what this um, what these positive political fiction look like in our setup, right? We told you that there's a change. Um, like first of all, Parks is a comedy, right? It's not political fiction; it's a sitcom. But we told you that um, there's a progressive change from someone who sees there's a, a, a like. A, a difficult situation in the status quo and want to change it both internally and externally. I already said that. So now how we get better and more and better critique of politicians. Side opposition is going to argue that negative political fiction is a form of art that criticizes the system and keeps it accountable. This is extremely flawed panel as the impact of the show by itself is very minimal. There are other more impactful means of criticizing the system like media, news and legal proceedings. So the real impact stems from whether it's able to galvanize people to critique the government on these matters. We employ you to judge the debate by this metric because as mentioned before, people are far more likely to become more complacent because of negative political fiction, right? Even if it does a great job at bringing to light structural issues in the political system or government, it does not manage to get the crucial stakeholder, the viewer, excited enough to want to critique the system or do something about it. This is because of the reasons we gave you, right? We told you that negative fiction, political fiction is often shown that in order to actually critique and bring about change, several uncom uncompromisable hurdles and challenges must be faced, which disincentivizes the viewer, especially given like the status quo liberal bubbles that tell them that the world is not doing that well, tell them that the world um, is, is hopeless, right? Apart from viewers that are getting generally more interested in the system, they're also gonna want to believe in the potential for achieving these positive outcomes. But viewers are far more likely to have higher expectations of the current political setup and look to compare current governments or political processes with ones that they have seen fictionally. Of course, it's like rooted in reality as viewers are like rational enough to distinguish from impossible fiction and reality, but this results in like more and like more better and more active critique, right? Viewers are far more invested in the first place in, in like the political system. Secondly, viewers are far, far less, more likely to set higher expectations for the political system and want to attempt to achieve it, either through like voting or at best activism. It's just like if I see to President Tom Kirkman, a like designated survivor, being able to pass bipartisan policies through compromise and reasoning, I hold President Biden to a much higher standard to achieve the same thing. And these higher expectations are always better than lower expectations in a political system, even if they're unrealistic, as long as voters are engaged enough with the political setup. On our side, we get governments and politicians forced to, forced to live up to higher expectations, making it much harder for them to push down propaganda and campaigns and discuss minor issues. We get greater bipartisanship, in it is, which is far more achievable as positive fiction often highlights the potential for arriving at solutions rather than the impossibility of it never been prouder to propose. Thank you. Hi, uh, just checking that I'm both audible and visible. Yep. Amazing. Perfect. Give me uh, a second. Yeah. Georges, all set? What's Excellent. Up? So thank you to the first proposition speaker for their speech, and you may begin whenever you are set. Yep, just give me one second start. Karthik, you need to move your sheets a little, please. Yep. Um, is the camera perfect? 
Speaker, when Donald Trump launched an insurrection on Capitol Hill on the 6th of January, we called it Orwellian. We analogized it to the manipulative Frank Underwood's impeachment from House of Cards. We think that this emphasized its villainy. It helped us communicate it and made the deliverance of justice swift and effective. That is the world that we support on our side of the house. Two arguments on Team India. First, on why we create more political engagement, and second, on why this engagement translates to beneficial outcomes. Before that, what's our stance on this debate? First, on optimism. What does this look like? We think they broadly need to understand and push three things. First, a presumption that democracy is fair. It will all work out. So we think that in shows like Parks and Recreation, where the main character is played by Amy Poehler, saying that city government is amazing. Come over, you'll always be heard. Even if these are sitcoms, fundamentally, these are political fiction. At the point at which they fictionally describe politics, like I don't get where they were going with that POI response at first. Second, we think that these shows are often lighthearted in nature. So necessarily, they are things like sitcoms like Beat, West Wing and Parks and Rec at the point at which they need to be positive, at the point at which they need to be optimistic and lighthearted by virtue of the motion. Third, it idealizes politicians and paints utopic pictures of the world. Women in office, despite the context of the real world. Politicians being showed as benevolent, running for your communities and for the right reasons, where everyone works together at the end of the day. What is the comparative on pessimism? Before I explain this, one important response to Gov. Our case is the only unique way of spreading this narrative. Why? Because of the analysis first proposition gives you. That is to say, fiction serves a really important purpose in terms of spreading a message, and therefore this is the unique way to do it. What does our policy look like? First, if you show a democracy, showing it as being broken. Brad Underwood in the House of Parts playing the dirty game of politics, where he horse treats issues he campaigned on and arm twists the Senate. It characterizes politicians as fundamentally greedy and power hungry. But second, it shows authoritarianism and overreach. This looks like George Orwell's 1983, which tells you Big Brother is watching. Crucially, it emphasizes in the plot two things. First, that you devolve into evil because of inaction. There's an, there's an initial conception of good when you have good states, but at the point at which we let evil fester and don't take action against it, you end up with these terrible scenarios. Second, we also often just show you working within broken systems. And yes, these are dark stories where sure, you don't end up with the system being fixed perfectly, but we end with you opening your eyes and recognizing that the system is unjust like you do in Black Mirror. Before I move on with my case, a few bits of engagement. First, I want to deal with the big thing that they tell you in stance, that people change corrupt structures and fix all these problems. Because, like, look, I think that their conception of this round is wrong. Because if these movies show you massive successes, yeah, then they're optimistic. However, you can't glorify political system as first proposition once and be overwhelmingly positive at the point at which you have to establish the brutality that you are moving away from. At the point at which you show the first bad point of authoritarianism in the first place, that means that the system has to be bad and you can't push infallibility. I like the fact that their speaker is nodding along to my speech. I like that they understand this. On the first argument, look, we think that you end up glorifying politics on their side of the house. That's the analysis that you get from them. Government takes on the burden of glorification. Crucially, this is terrible. Why? Why? Because it shows that it's infallible. There's the presumption of benevolence. At the point at which first proposition characterizes this to you as being powerful, as carrying on into the real world, that's the point at which you don't get accountability on their side of the house, especially because their words, not mine, you glorify the system. Second, like their benefits on fun and escapism are symmetric. There's lots of other genres that you can engage with. But the last flip to this, look, false optimism is toxic. Why? Because minority groups push on and on for change on their side of the house. They're told to be optimistic, but they never get it because of unjust systems and a power asymmetry. The problem with their side of the house is that it pushes the onus onto you. You feel like you are you at are. fault for not getting change. Lastly, on the second argument on setting higher expectation, look, First proposition flip-flops on how realistic this actually is. But if I as a social movement say, you know what, I saw on Netflix that you as a political party can be better, that's the point at which social movements are called stupid. That's the point at which they are villainized and delegitimized, and their ability to get change goes away when you start comparing real-world governments to fictional governments from designated survivor. On the first argument, why do they worsen engagement on their side of the house? A few reasons this is true. First, Positive shows have a sense of inevitability. 
That is to say, democracy will always work itself out. At the end of the day, there will always be a happy ending. This fundamentally takes away agency from individual voters because you don't think your vote matters because it always works out at the end of the day. That is bad because that means you don't vote. But crucially, here's the important mechanism. Lots and lots of people don't vote. And that creates a collective action problem where I am less likely to march, where I am less likely to protest and vote. That makes engagement with politics and accountability worse. But second, we think that these shows are unrelatable to people because as first proposition themselves concede, the real world isn't as perfect. That means you can't picture yourself in these shows with the perfect representation of women and minority, women and minorities in governments and benevolent leaders. That means you drop this book, you switch the TV channel and you decide to watch something else instead. This is terrible because if both sides in this debate agree, any political fiction is a good in and of itself. That's why both sides, by virtue of this motion, are fine with the other side showing either positive or negative fiction in the minority. This fiction is good because it creates interest and awareness about politics. But when you don't engage with the genre at all on their side of the house, you can't get any benefits whatsoever. On comparative, why are we far better? Voter turnout, contrary to what they say, increases on our side of the house. Why? Because and the collective action problem is fixed because you are more likely to vote and participate in democracy when you are motivated by fear. Why? Because this is you inherent are. human nature. This is why the most prominent form of campaigning in democracy is fear mongering. The reason why we had the highest political voter turnout in the US in 2020 was because people were scared of another Trump administration. We think that we fix the collective action problem because these books show how society has let these problems fester and has been ignorant. That forces people to action. Before I move on, yeah. So you talk about voting through fear, but on our side, we tell you that you're essentially telling people that even if you vote, there are going to be negative consequences to that vote. Whereas you give an example of Trump, whereas people had the belief that they could remove Trump from office, yeah, which yeah. does not happen in negative political So, so what we're saying is that at the point at which you didn't vote, that's how you end up with Frank Underwood. That's how you end up with terrible politicians, a cycle of ignorance. On our side, you recognize that you don't have to be ignorant and that when you step in, you can prevent these horrible politicians from coming to power in the first place. Let's then move on to the second argument. Look, to make politics seem optimistic, you can't show the depressing idea of women being labeled, quote unquote, not electable. The reality of politicians like AOC being called slurs when they are loud, never being taken as seriously as your male peers. You can't show African-Americans being gerrymandered because that is, quote unquote, pessimistic. That's showing that there's a glaring issue in the system. That means you end up with shows like Weep and Parks and Rec, where you gloss over sexism, where you add laugh tracks and minimize the scale of harm, because that's how you're positive. That's how you're happy. In our side, you have shows like Queen, 13th, and the First Lady that show how structurally disadvantaged minorities are in politics in the first place. We think that that means we fundamentally on our side of the house finally, finally, finally have an acknowledgement of these problems. This acknowledgement of problems is the most important thing in this round because at the point at which you don't acknowledge these problems in the first place, you can never actually hold people accountable. At the end of this round, we've proven to you a few things. First, that you make accountability far better and that you increase political participation and engagement. For all of those reasons, vote off. Thank you. Uh, could I ask Team India if you could keep your camera on? Did you miss any part of the speaker just now? No, no, no. After the speech, I think. Okay, yeah. Okay, cool. you're fine. Hello, apologies, can you hear me? I think my internet connection just died momentarily. Okay, I didn't miss any part of the speech. Uh, so we're good. Okay. Uh, give me one second, so I can reset something in the connection.
Can you hear and see me? Yeah. Yes? OK. Uh, excellent. This should be OK. Yeah, OK. Uh, are judges ready to proceed? Cool. I'll ask if possible. Um, I'm not sure if this is an issue with my internet, but Team India, if you could have your camera on throughout the duration of the debate. Oh, yeah. I'm so sorry about that. It's back on. No, no worries. Thank you. All right. In which case, we thank the speaker for the speech and call upon the second speaker of Team Proposition to deliver that. Is. All right. I'm going to begin in three, two, one. Panel, if Parks and Rec is a positive political fiction, the office is about business and administration. It is by definition a mockumentary. We think Team India constantly takes us at our worst and you cannot let them get away with it. Here's the thing, right? We think the key difference is this. Their speaker opens with an example about an impeachment. Impeachment can also happen on our side, but its results are fruitful. On their side, even after the, an attempted impeachment, Frank Underwood is still president. That's the key difference. That's what happens. Three questions we ask on team proposition. One, which side gets more social change? Two, which side gets deals with issues better? And three, which side gets more toxic spheres? One then on which side gets more social change. They constantly take us at our worst. Parks and Rec Recreation is a mockumentary. Not all positive fiction is lighthearted. My fourth speaker gives you this in setup. Why do people watch this fiction? We tell you that fiction, or like whether it be in the form of a book or in a movie, still likes to be realistic in order to maintain consumer bases. Meaning to say, you have realistic people, you have realistic issues, and you have real problems. Except on our side, you, you, you're able to overcome that. That means we can still have sexism. We can still have gerrymandering. It's just that on our side, we're actually able to overcome them by portraying good, healthy governments. But let's take them at their best here. Let's say we do have, say, even some lightheartedness. We think even then, when you are lighthearted about problems like sexism or about problems like gerrymandering, it is more likely to actually, people are more likely to internalize them as problems rather than on your side when they are desensitized to them. Why is this the case? Because on our side, when you, when you showcase something as satire, people are more likely not to notice it, but they are sub, it's subconsciously, you instill in them that it's a problem and a problem that they might address in the future. But on their side, people are constantly desensitized to things like sexism. Black people themselves are desensitized to racism because the unfortunate reality is this. They encounter it in all spheres of life. You still address the problem better, even if it is addressed lightheartedly. Right now, why do we say that nihilism is more likely on their side than inspired change? This is there's one mech that both sides rely on in this debate. What actually happens in the status quo? They seem to think that the status quo is this. People love the government. People think the government is lovely. The government is great. And on their side, they expose problems. They inspire change. This is simply not true. The status quo is in short of problems. People know that governments are power hungry, like they suggest they are. People know that governments want authority. Fox News constantly reduces government trust. I think this is what both sides have their impacts resting on. Except here's what happens on ours. On our side, you compare the image of a negative government that already exists, and you take it with the one of a positive you're able to internalize a utopia that you think is realistic simply because there are realistic characters realistic people good people playing those roles you are more likely than to actually think that it's possible for you to make change rather than for you to like succumb to the harsh reality that their side poses on their side, we tell you this, you go further into your rabbit hole, you are further, you're more nihilistic than you ever have been because you lose faith in the in the politics, political system of your nation. The po politics is already bad. Their side demonizes it. They make it worse. Very crucial to note. Now, which side actually deals with issues better? Now, if you want to take us at our absolute worst and assume that all political fiction is Pax and Rec and all negative fiction is like, like literally only about politics, here's the thing. We deal with issues better in places where abusive governments exist. Meaning to say, even if we are unable to inspire Delta, 
we make it easier for people to deal with authoritative governments. Meaning to say, people in these areas are constantly distressed. People in these areas need a sense of distraction. They would like rather to see political fiction. They are more likely to see it, to want to watch it, and therefore internalize it subconsciously than to watch something that like literally reflects the harsh reality of their situation. Meaning to say, if I am in a real life situation that resembles that of House of Cards, I am a better, I'm, I'm, I'm like more likely to want to watch parks and recreation because it is something that this distracts me from real life issues. It acts as an escape for me. And in that process, I am more likely to internalize things. Whereas when I'm watching House of Cards, all it does is pushes me further down the rabbit hole and it makes me upset about my surroundings, upset about the people around me. This makes things very difficult on an individual scale because as a person, it reduces contentment. You are more, you're less likely to like, not only not, not vote, even on a general scale, you're less likely to do things like obey laws because you you lose trust in the government entirely. This is very important panel because even if none of us get social change, we like we deal with issues and trauma importantly better. Now, which side deals with bad politics better? But before that, I want to take a POI. Look, why can't we emphasize the scale of problems by doing things like talking about how something is Orwellian, thus communicating the idea that it's terrible and evoking emotion because fiction is uniquely accessible? Fiction is uniquely accessible and both sides of fiction can actually showcase the problem. On our side, you can still have people being sexist, people troubling black people, except on our side, the government does things about that and change is made. And on your side, people are pushed further down the rabbit hole and people lose faith in the system. That's the key difference. We both showcase the problem, only one showcases the solution. Now, how do we normalize bad politics? This, like, how do you normalize? How, like, how do we like denormalize bad politics? This is an independent path to victory. Assuming that voters are really engaged with the political system and how somehow still interested in democratic processes, negative political fiction is still bad. Why? Because it helps desensitize or internalize bad politicians. Meaning to say, on House of Cards, impeachments and bad precedents come ever before, way before Donald Trump does did right this means that people have a very low bar for political politish politicians to actually cross they are willing to allow poor policy decisions or inappropriate actions at the cost of democracy itself because they are used to seeing people that they actually like tv show characters that they relate to they think are humanized because of the tv shows and when they those same people are reflected in real life you do not have that much of an issue with them this looks like excusing donald trump's sexual offenses and potentially even marveling about it because you are used to see leaders behave this way on House of Cards. This is a very, very crucial comparative panel because you're on, you're able to vote in politicians that are bad. You're able to vote in politicians that you ideally wouldn't, but on their side, because you are normalizing a bad overview of politicians, because you are internalizing this image, you feel that it's normal. You feel that it's somewhat acceptable. This is a harsh reality, one that we are not willing to accept. We tell you that politicians are only able to get away with cheap mistakes and errors because it has been normalized through this kind of fiction. The voting populace has largely given up on the potential for a good leader. This is why we see voters being increasingly lenient with the age of leaders, the past history of leaders, and even corruption. It leads to things like this. They are unable to equate these actions with relevant consequences as pop culture normalizes it for them through negative TV shows. The same way you normalize rappers taking lives in real life because of movies that showcases that they do, you, 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 like, you normalize politicians being inherently bad people. You let them get away with it. You treat politicians as a restaurant where like every, every single meal in the buffet is that of a bad individual. You tend to normalize it. Now, I'm sorry if I nodded in my speech. It's just that when things are asserted, my neck tends to hurt. So proud to propose. Thank you. Thank the speaker for their speech and now call upon the second speaker. Actually, no, sorry. Judges, are you good? <laughs> Apologies. Yep, yep, yep. Excellent. Cool. Thank the speaker for their speech and call upon the second speaker side opposition to deliver there.
Okay, can you hear me? Yep. My speech. Okay, no pain, don't you? I'm going to start my speech in three, two, Team UAE in this debate is very, very sneaky because they keep saying things like, imagine this utopia, imagine this perfect world in which democracy and the world is everything and there are no problems. The reason they only stuck to this language is because that utopia just does not exist. And that utopia is something we'll never achieve. And we would love for their next speaker to actually talk about what actually happens. Because instead, their second speaker decided to make their entire speech about being decent to harm. Now, I don't think people are watching five to six or like even 10 to 12 political movies. I think the vast majority are going to stick to probably one or two. So that doesn't mean people are going to take to the streets on either side of the debate. Instead, we think people on our side and movies will create uh, movies that are often dystopias that make people feel bad about the fact that these political situations arise and that we actually have to take action. We don't think that there are any movies that second proposition realistically thinks this debate's about where people are just desensitized to racism and democracy crumbling. What movies are they even watching on their side? Um, two questions in the speech before my argument on how this is actually a bad thing, even if we take the absolute best case that you aim for idealism. Firstly, on change. Secondly, on engagement. Firstly, on change. What I want to do in the speech is I want to break the likely deadlock that will exist between the two sides, because their side is saying that you are likely to hold politicians to a higher standard and higher expectation and you're going to demand change. And our side is saying that you're going to notice that your politician is becoming more like the very villains in these dystopias. And as a result, you're likely to push for change. Why do we think we win this particular clash? The first reason is that they themselves concede that on their side of the house, they're glorifying political institutions, that they're glorifying politicians, that you should believe in these politicians because they're good people inherently. If that is the case, I do not think that you would reasonably be questioning these in the interests of the incentives of these politicians on your side of the house or think that they are horrible people. Um, and as a result, we actually don't think that you're going to push for as much change as you will under our side of the house, because our side tells them that, the, that, that you should be skeptical of these individuals, whereas their side doesn't. But secondly, we explained to you why the force of paranoia, the force of uh, the, the power of being risk averse is something that is inherent to human nature. That is under our side of the house, the moment you see your politician slipping and sliding into what is someone like Big Brother, that is when you are likely to do things like say, oh my God, this particular politician is becoming worse and worse, and we cannot let that situation arise. That happens because people are inherently risk averse in society. Their side of the house relies on optimism, but optimism often comes with diminishing marginal returns. That is, every time a politician does something better, it doesn't feel that it doesn't feel like that um, additional benefit that that politician or like the additional policy that that politician passed is that good. So you're not going to pressure that politician as much. You're more likely to do it in a world where you're more risk averse under our side. But three, their side is devoid from reality. Tell me what politician out there or what political systems out there in the world that just have people who just love politics, who just love the people who are not corrupt, who are not inherently selfish. We think the sad reality of the world is that there there are there are these people that overwhelmingly exist. So on the, on the basis of reality, we think it's much more better to have media that tells them the truth, that tells them that this is something that could get worse, rather than lie about it. Their, their second speaker thought that it was good to eat the, to have their cake and eat it too. That black people will apparently be desensitized to, the, to, to things like sexism. But the problem with this particular argument is that on their side of the house, in a world where you're glorifying things like optimism, what inherently happens is that in a movie, even though you're talking about the problem or the fact that like government systems aren't working, you need to structurally devote more time for the optimistic elements of the movie than the bad or the sad parts of the movie, which means you simplify things like racism. You make it very easy um, to like overcome, which we think is actually kind of offensive. So if they really cared about making sure that these movies were sensitive to different groups of people, we don't think that they're as sensitive on their, under their side where they simplify the problems when we actually think the problem of racism deserves more time. And we think that, yes, it is something akin to dystopia that we need to address and not let occur. Second question in the speech on engagement. The two, the, the, their side basically says that people will like voting, they'll glorify the process, they're more likely to engage in it. Our side is saying that if you don't vote or if you don't take action, this dystopia is likely to arise. Why do we think that we win this particular clash here? The first here is that 
you are more likely to take it seriously under our side of the house because they conceded that the types of shows that will occur or that will exist on their side are things like sitcoms that make politics easy that don't make it something that really impacts people's lives because it's just something that like in deep the politician can laugh to on our side we make it something that can change that can really affect people's lives in bad ways and as a result the fact that this cost is really high um, means that your cost benefit analysis of not voting or not acting is glorified under our side of the house which means you're more likely to vote on our side than theirs but second we think success is uh, much more yeah. measurable right so success on our side of the house is preventing dystopia preventing trump from getting elected into power that is something that is a clearer goal that you can conceptualize and get then like i don't know um have the us how they i don't know the indian um uh, you know government become that of finland we think it's very hard to like get there than it is to like prevent a dystopia from happening. So we think people are more likely to engage in this because they just think that it's something they can do and they're not going to be like, I'm never going to reach this idealistic world. It's There's no point in actually achieving it. So we think we're more likely to have momentum because we actually say that this change is something that is reasonable and something that you can actually achieve. But the third way in which we break this is that we've explained you that mean. on our side of the house, no thank you, dystopias, or rather not just dystopias, but just broken political systems or struggles are more relatable to people than idealistic worlds. And the reason for this is because people always complain that their government isn't doing anything, unless their side believes that governments are just, you know, doing everything perfectly. The fact that people know that there are problems with their governments means that on our side of the house, they're more likely to do things like actually relate to things, uh, to, to dystopic films. On their side, when you spend more of your time glorifying the idea of it, no, thank you, you're not likely to believe that this is real. You're likely to believe that this is fantasy world, or as they said, utopia, and you're not going to engage with it as much. You're not actually going to think politics is the same way. We think that the state of the world is that there's more populism, the, uh, there's democratic blacksliding in places like Poland. So we think our films are more relatable and will have more engagement. I'll take that POI. If dystopia is relatable, why do you need it for skepticism? The reason you need it is because of the fact that uh, uh, is, is because of the fact that you need movies that actually bring people into caring about politics in the first place, right? These movies, as you yourself laid out, have unique benefits in actually making people care about the political system. Those films capitalize on that. On your side, no one watches these films the way they do on our side. Why do we think on um, uh, our third argument here is taking them at their absolute best case? Why do we think aspiring for idealism is bad? There are three reasons for this. The first is that often idealism is westernized, right? So it's concepts like democracy, which we don't necessarily necessarily think um, work in like the vast majority of contexts and, 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 and many other countries. But secondly, it's often, um, uh, there's just never going to be a, an idealistic world. There's never going to be a perfect world because there are always trade-offs that have to be made. But three, we don't often think that it's possible or pragmatic to have this form of idealism because it's just impossible to achieve it in some cases. So in places like Africa, um, we know that there are so many different ethnicities. Um, in uh, So it's really difficult to like ensure a perfect form of governance. We know this is the case because we've all been working really hard on the Africa motion, which means that you'll never actually aspire or you'll never actually get to idealism in the first place, which means you're wasting money, you're wasting time aspiring to it and never getting to it. On our side, at least in our worst case scenario, we prevent dystopia, we prevent governments from becoming worse. We think that's a much better world than getting nothing done at all. For all of those reasons, we're incredibly proud to stand on opposition. Thank you. Panel all set. Okay, we thank the speaker for their speech and call from the third speaker to cite proposition to deliver the minutes. All right. Oh, sorry. Time on. My bad. Okay. Yeah.
three, two, one, go. Ladies and gentlemen, let's understand this. Both sides are largely agreeing upon the fact that political apathy is a real problem in the world. So the real winner of this debate is the team that's able to prove two things. Firstly, which side is able to get greater political involvement? And secondly, which side is able to get better criticism and minimize desensitization to bad things, to bad behavior and to bad political actions, right? As I said earlier. So really what we need to get from side or opposition in this debate is how this idea of fear is not just going to trigger people to maybe want to grieve about what's happening or feel bad about what's happening, but also how that call for action actually translate into the, it translates into the person actually going and doing something about it. So it's not just about what you think or what you feel. Like I may watch like a really sad movie about like, you know, people dying on the streets because of like authoritarian leaders, but unless I'm able to actually see something happening to that authoritarian leader that results in a positive outcome, why will I want to go and as they say, people are not risk averse. Why will I want to go and lay my, lay my life down for something that's unachievable? So when they talk about the unachievable, well, sure, utopia is not necessarily unachievable. What, what they're essentially telling people is they're living in a dystopia and there's no way out. And that is the fundamental problem with side opposition stance. And this is going to be like increased by this narrative that, that's propagated by these negative political shows. Now, let's understand some quick clarification here, right? So they give us some big examples up front about what these political shows look like on our side. We tell you these positive political shows are any political show that, in, that may involve like, you know, hurdles that may involve backlash, that may involve protests and things like that. But eventually there's a positive political outcome to each episode or to each movie or whatever, right? We think that that positive outcome is what defines whether it's a like a positive political show or not. A negative political show is more likely to display sort of negative outcomes and also the negative characters are more likely to remain, you know, escape scot-free, right? And I think to some extent, both sides are arguing to this definition. So we don't really want, I don't want to spend more time on this. So getting to the first question in this debate, the first area of clash, what about greater political involvement? So they first tell us people are going to want to engage out of fear. Right? They say they're scared that if they don't vote, they're going to get this Frank Underwood. And they give us the example of Donald Trump. Now, again, three responses to this. Firstly, no. Right? We think that what people okay. see is that despite public voting in House of Cards, Frank Underwood still ends up winning. So they lose faith in the potential of their vote itself. So even if they're fearing the idea that Frank Underwood is going to come up or whatever, right? We think that they lose faith in the potential of what they could do in society to actually change that political system. Because despite the actions of characters in House of Cards, you still have people who are potentially sexual sex offenders or people who are extremely corrupt still ending up with power and still holding on to that power. So when, when you talk about how politicians are evil and unaccountable, what essentially happens is with on their side with negative shows, you seem to believe that they're continuing, they're going to still remain evil and unaccountable, and there's nothing you can do really about it, right? And so when you talk about Donald Trump, the idea that what? Donald Trump can be taken down is a lot more important than the idea that Donald Trump is a scary man. Right? We think that if Democrats did not believe that there are alternatives to Donald Trump and something better than him exists, there would be no reason to vote him out. We think that on our side with positive shows, you either show some kind of good role model leaders or you show that autocratic governments can be taken down. So if people thought that if, you, if people think, and when they watch these shows, if people think that there can be some kind of delta that is created in society by individual action, they're automatically more likely to be called for action. And that's really what we're standing for here. I don't know why I had to spend so much time on this, reiterating something that my first and second speaker has already explained, which side opposition has not understood. But coming to another important area, right? They say creating an idea that democracy is fair is toxic, but let's understand. We're not saying democracy is fair. What these shows portray is that democracy can be fair. Because let's understand, people are rational enough to understand the difference between fiction and reality. So if they see something extremely, like when I see like in the movie RRR, people jumping on buildings, I don't think I can jump on buildings. But I'm empowered to believe that you can be strong and you can have that willpower, right? So we think that when people watch these political shows, they may not completely believe that everything is plausible in the real world. But we do think that they're aiming for aspects of that utopia in the first place, right? So when they say, when they say that 
false optimism is creating like bad mindsets for minorities who are told that nothing can be done. What's actually happening is on their side, you're telling a minority, wait and watch, this racist, corrupt man still gets far and still holds on to it. Whereas in positive shows, something ends up happening to that racist man. Some, I mean, if they want to call it humorous or not, something ends up happening whereby the minority man actually gets something out of it. Like the minorities actually get something out of it in the show. So at least people feel a lot better, even if there's no real call for action. But coming to this even if case that I want to talk to you about, right? So let's talk about desensitization and criticism. So they talk firstly about how the media should not lie about reality. Firstly, very often these shows do come Kind of exaggerate reality but let's assume it's exactly as it is now they also tell us that well people end up only watching like one or two shows so the delta isn't really great so this really is the case there are other kinds of media that end up scrutinizing and criticizing this reality that they talk a lot about right so if in my life i'm seeing people criticize and seeing sort of this struggle going on around me why do i want to actually go on to watch even more shows where I'm only going to see more and more of this. So all that impacts rests on the idea that you're actually end up, you're going to end up watching these shows in the first place, right? And we think that people are going to be tired of seeing the same sort of struggle that other media sources are already portraying. Moreover, you are essentially pushing people further down the problem that they're trying to potentially find some alleviation from. Now, before I get to like, you know, how this is an even if case, but let's understand this. Why? Even if voters are extremely interested on their side, if voters are suddenly going to watch all these shows and because of watching these negative shows, they're actually going to end up wanting to vote. We still think this kind of voting is bad because on their side, these voters are seeing politics that's extremely bad normalized. They're seeing sex offenders being normalized in, uh, in the leadership system, right? And we get no response from this in the second speaker. My second speaker spent like five minutes of his entire life on this and we get nothing on that. We tell you that people should be aware of the fact that sometimes leaders cannot be like this. We think that they need to set higher bars, higher expectations for politics of today. And that not only decreases political apathy, it also increases better voting. So we tell you that on our side, people are watching these good shows, seeing good role model leaders, seeing Tom Kirkman and Designated Survivor and believing that bipartisanship is possible. Sure, they may be able to distinguish between the utopia side of it and the compromise side of it as well. And we think that people are likely to create these higher barriers of entry for corrupt politicians and for people who, anyways, uh, quick POI, one second to go. Which is it? Are these movies too realistic that you will basically able, be able to envision a utopia? Are they not realistic at all that you won't actually understand what this utopia is and not have any change? I mean, I don't want to sit and analyze shows for you, but to some extent, these shows are often grounded in reality to the point where it's based on the current political system. Sure, as you said, it often describes reality in a slightly fictional manner, but people are able to distinguish between things that are extremely impossible things are relatively achievable and they're able to hold on to that achievable side of things and use it as a mechanism for them to actually go out there, vote and make a difference, right? So again, as I said earlier, on our side, these are they, they may hold on to aspects of shows and set higher expectations for politics that's happening today. So let's summarize quickly, right? We tell you that on our side, we're not only getting better criticism of politics because of higher expectations set for these politicians in the first place. We're also getting voters more interested, reducing political apathy because people believe the system can change. So even if people are not fearing the system or fearing the potential harms of the system, which by, by itself is something we've contended with. We think that these problems are still displayed in these political shows. We still think on our side, they're likely to see the positive outcomes of those problems and are likely to embrace those solutions and actually solve collective action in a better manner. What they get is worse collective action. And with that, we win this debate. Thank you. Thank you. Let me know whenever you guys are ready so I can start. Panel, all set. Okay, we thank the speaker for their speech and we'll call upon the third speaker to the opposition to deliver that. Hi, I'm Alipo. Great. Starting my speech in three, two, Side proposition starts out with telling you, 
this narrative is just so so powerful that it'll make individuals just stop following laws stop voting on our side of the house but when it comes to actually engaging with the arguments it's just people just don't buy into this narrative like obviously people are so realistic that accountability isn't something that you can get on your side of the house much like the voters on their side of the house they just didn't want to engage with us so proud to oppose three clashes in this speech then firstly just clarifying what exactly is it that each of each side has to support secondly which side increases political engagement thirdly which side increases accountability first clash then on just clarifying what each world looks like and at the top of this i'm just going to have fun quoting them back and proving my point with their words first notice you're likely not portraying them as bad politics because you have the glorification of politics on their side of the house and by extension that means glorifying democracy glorifying politicians who just care about you who want you to succeed in life but secondly again because it is a happy fun image of distraction you just cannot talk about the struggles that individuals are actually going through because that's not really soothing right that's not really distracting to individuals who don't want to think about hard serious stuff that's what they told you on their side of the house that's what they have to support but thirdly if they believe that it is talking about problems means that you desensitize people to problems that you just normalize those problems i'm unsure what their comparative looks like and i think that means that they just don't talk about problems at all that the political system is just so wonderful that everything's going so good that's how you can stop all desensitization of problems on their side of the house by their own words so what this means is that they're telling you on their narrative anything you want you actually you just will be given because politicians care about you they care about your future they want what's best for you and sometimes they may, may make mistakes sometimes they do things that are not the best for you but you should trust them because actually they know better than you but let's take them on their best case that somehow you get some level of change that is very very superficial let's be very clear what this change will look like is very sappy change right because of the all of the reasons i've given you earlier it means like for instance you know what let's everyone just come together let's hold hands let's recognize that everyone's different externally but at heart with the same and that's why no sexism exists that's why black politicians can just easily get into power on our side of the on their side of the house even though right now in the real world they've been struggling for decades to do so that's what the narrative and their side looks like we are not willing to support it let's then compare this to what we want our narrative to look like and what we made clear about from the very start first it looks like comparing bad structures and telling you that the reason why this happened why this politician is bad is because of the inaction in the past that you had the ability to change it but just because you didn't want to work just because you didn't want to come out and vote that's why you caused this problem in the first place but second if the instance that politicians are bad that means that on our side of the house you need to recognize that politicians just inherently might have some greedy might have some very power hungry uh, characteristics and that's why you need to be clear, be keeping them in check and recognize it doesn't always have to be unsuccessful it can be successful for instance all the lies that they told you about house of cards aren't just true at the end of the day frank underwood was impeached and what this means is that on our side of the house we get that much better second clash then on political engagement before i move on is there any view morgan freeman was the first black president of the us before barack obama do you think that had a greater impact than kevin spacey actively saying that you know racism is all right I'm unsure we're just dropping names that mean names. That you still aren't engaging with a number of all of the responses that we've given you. Second clash then is political engagement. And at the top of this clash, let's be very, very clear, right? individuals want change they want for instance stuff to happen that materially improves their lives that makes it easier for them to go about their lives that for instance means that they go up the ranks of social mobility recognizing that that's what individuals always want at the end of the day let's prove why they get that much worse on their side of the house firstly notice the narrative that you get on their side of the house is that this will just happen anyway right because you're so optimistic because you're so hopeful that the future will always be bright that's when you are less less likely to put in and push for change because why should you have to give up your day of work to go out on the street and protest why should you have to read up about a number of things politicians are doing so you can make the right informed choice when other people will do it for you and the act and the end of the day the result will always be what's best for you that's what you make individuals say and that's when you force them into engaging less with their side of the house 
works. On comparative, we tell you you're able to see what might happen if you don't actually engage, if you don't actually put in the effort that is necessitated of you to be a part of this political structure properly. You know and that means that on our side of the house, we, uh, we get individuals actually trying to get change on our side. And let's be very clear, nobody thinks they're at the situation of no return right now. Rather, they think they're at the situation of which the problem of no return will be caused right now because of two reasons. One, because people can see there are certain good things in their life. They see that it can get much, much worse in the future. But second, social justice movements exist. They work in tandem with this narrative. They're pushing you to act change, to act now or act never. That's what the climate change movement literally tells you. What this means is that on our side of the house, the fear pushes you to actually act change on our side. But second, on this idea that you can just figure out the differences between politicians, let's be very clear. You just won't see such sort of political drama in the first place. Because if you just want a distraction, why not watch a rom-com on Netflix? We think you come to political dramas to find relatability, to find yourself represented in the political systems they're talking about. You don't represent them. You think they're not realistic. That means you don't get them watching these political dramas at the end of the day. At the end of this clash, okay, I want right. to do a couple of pieces of being. Firstly, notice it, it, both sides can change. The difference on our side of the house is that you get more urgent change, that you push for much more change, much more quicker because you're scared of where it can actually be, become worse. But secondly, notice we can trade this off with our third clash uh, because of the fact that it doesn't matter if you're all showing up voting to just vote blindly. That's why accountability matters. You actually grant legitimacy to really terrible governments on their side of the house in the best case. But second, you end up prioritizing the sorts of politicians you see, the role models they want to talk about, they always just end up being charismatic and give you sympathetic stuff because that's what, for instance, movies can make more money of. That's what more relatable characters are. And guess what those sorts of politicians look like in real life? So they're actually populist co politicians that don't want to talk about policies, just make lies about their personalities. Those are the sorts of people you get them voting on on their side of the house. Last question on accountability. Let's be clear. We told you that you show racism, you show struggles of sexism on our side of the house. They right. say that this was called desensitization. That means they're much more happy to not never show this. But let's then actually to prove to you why this will never cause desensitization. First, you have an incentive to show problems that have never been covered before. That means that you're giving them the first idea, first way of covering them because the fact that every show wants to differentiate it from itself. So let's say, for instance, how I got away with murder, talking about black abortions very specifically in the political system. Those are the sorts of things that you can get to attract viewers in the first place. Second, showing one TV show doesn't make you think that anything that is bad is no longer bad. They claim that apparently black people will become desensitized to racism now, something that affects their lives so, so significantly. And I said the house, we can much more likely talk about the deep implications of these problems. So for instance, when you talk about a, mad, uh, a documentary about, for instance, a politician sexually harassing someone, that's when you're much more likely to hold Donald Trump accountable because you can see firsthand the victim's trauma and you feel much more sympathetic to them. That's when on our side of the house, you get people being much more more accountable. But on a comparative, they can see that they don't get accountability when they told you that they just want to glorify politicians. This means that you actually don't get change that you need on their side of the house. But second, even in the best case, we just get accountability and not political engagement. That's still something we're willing to take because what this means is that once you get change right now, in the long term, you can get individuals much, much more engaged in the political system. I have never been more prouder to oppose. Thank you. Hi, just checking that I'm both audible and visible again. Yep, just give us a minute. Yep. Panel, all set? Cool, cool, cool. Excellent. Uh, we thank the speaker for their speech, and I now call the opposition reply speaker to deliver those. Speaker, first and second proposition in this debate spend far, far too long rebutting the one example of parks and recreation. They repeatedly say they don't have to defend sitcoms. But if you take a second to read the info slide, unfortunately for them, the examples the CA team gives of optimism is sitcoms, is shows like West Wing. Crucially, panel, the reason they were afraid of defending sitcoms, the epitome of optimism and positivity in political fiction is because they downplay the seriousness of systemic subjugation, because they make it impossible to mobilize. At the end of this round, the team UAE has to buy a bullet that they just did not want to bite down the line, that they just never properly engaged with. 
Bearing that in mind, two questions in this speech. First, on which side gets greater political engagement? Second, on which side gets greater consequences from that engagement? On the first question, look, people only engage with fiction when they see themselves in it and find it relatable. Both sides then in this debate agree on one thing. That is that political fiction in and of itself, regardless of whether it's positive or whether it's negative, it's valuable. That's why to an extent the motion makes that support positive portrayals and makes UAE support negative portrayals. Therefore, here's what that means for the round. On their side of the house, if people aren't watching these shows, that is terrible. Because if more people are watching the genre and even becoming slightly more aware on our side of the house, we take it over them because people are disillusioned by unrelatable shows on their side of the house. Whereas on ours, they're even slightly more engaged. That is a good in and of itself, the fact that they're engaging with the genre. That's very important way. But second, we think we need to take a second to just engage with them on this narrative being strong. Because crucially, this is a narratives debate. So to a large extent, we don't think the delta and the impacts are as bad, are as big as they claim they are. That was what the first point proved. This is going to be very charitable and take them at their best like we've done down the line. Let's assume this narrative is strong. On our side of the house, the fear of the consequence of inaction motivates you to vote motivates you to do things like come out and act, which is fundamentally the point at which we can get things like greater political engagement. On comparative, you think everything will work out. It will inevitably just be fine. Democracy will fix itself. That's the point at which you crucially create an action. On the second question then, the first thing that I wanna note is that winning on political engagement gives us an independent path to victory in and of itself, but I'm gonna prove the second question to give us one more. First, we think that they have toxic political optimism on their side of the house. Because let's make one thing clear. As Atisha explains in her third, black people are not desensitized to racism when it is visceral, when they have to deal with the harms of it literally every single day of their life. But what is the analysis that I gave you at first? The fact that they're disillusioned in Gov's world and they are immobilized at the point at which they're told to push through. They will all just like be all right at the end of the day. But at the point at which it isn't speaker, that's the point at which you feel like you are locked into structures that you cannot change. That is crucially terrible in terms of getting any change whatsoever on their side. But second, we think that they necessarily need to downplay political problems on their side of the house. The reason that is true is because the only way to push overwhelmingly positive and happy and optimistic narratives is by doing things like ensuring those narratives are pushed. Because let's make one thing clear and quote first propositions themselves. This debate is one about glorification on their side of the house. That it's terrible because it makes any semblance of accountability whatsoever literally impossible. The third and lastly, we've told you down the line that fiction is dramatic. The fiction is accessible and evokes unique senses of emotion. That's why on our side of the house, you can uniquely draw parallels between things like increased state surveillance via the Patriot Act and call that Orwellian. That's the point at which you can communicate the scale and how drastic these ideas are. We win both clashes in this debate. To conclude, I sympathize with second prop's neck problem. I just love the fact that he nods along to his teammates and finds them assertive too, much like we do on Team India Oppose. Thank you. All right. I'm going to begin. Three. One second. Oh, sorry. So sorry. So sorry. No worries. Panel, all set? Yep, yep. Yep. Okay. Whenever you're ready, uh, feel free to begin. Okay. I'm going to begin in three, two, one. Panel, when it was convenient for them, team opposition needed skepticism. And then when it was convenient for them, negativity was relatable. Their third speaker says this themselves, right? That, that the problem of no return is visible. People already know about it. Yet all they want to do is inspire people to actually know about issues. If it's relatable, Team India, if people already think you might get no return, that means people are already skeptic. You've shot yourselves in the foot. The framing is this: you have optimistic shows. This looks like straw. This is like this looks like solving problems, right? The motion says it. This uh, like the motion says optimistic shows. They talk about West Wing, right? 
West Wing is a political drama. The other example is that of Fahrenheit. That's a book about how a person overcomes problems within a political system. It's one thing to strawman us, right? It's another thing to actually strawman the motion. There are three independent paths to victory for Team UAE in this debate. First, on government trust, right? This is entirely unengaged, right? I tell you this, Manal, that even if on our side, you have things like parks and rec, it serves as a distraction from actual problems. Because the reality is what Steam India sometimes understands and sometimes doesn't, is that, that the reality is harsh, political systems are flawed, and problems are widespread. Right On our side, you distract yourselves from those problems at the very least, even if it's something like parks and recreation. You get a form of escapism, you're able to deal with those issues better. On their side, they demonize the systems around them. They tell them, they give them more reasons to loathe the society that they live in. People go further down the rabbit hole, people are more nihilistic. We win on government trust because on our side, because of this, people are more likely to actually do things on the individual level, let alone voting. People are likely to respect the people around them on our side because they're able to find another form of escape. On their side, escape from bad politics becomes people with, who, who drive rashly, people that don't follow laws, people that incite violence, the very capital invasion that they do talk about. We find escapism in other forms at our very least this is what taking a person at their best looks like. Now, toxic spheres, right? We tell you that on our side, you on their side, you normalize bad politics. Why? Because you already have bad people being the protagonist. Yes, Frank Underwood was impeached at the end of House of Cards, but viewers felt bad for him. Why? Because he was the protagonist. He was the person that they watched in House of Cards for five seasons. He was the person that they did connect to. That happens in real life because you've fallen in love with a person that is inherently a bad human being, that is inherently bad for democracy. You accept the same reality when an official sex offender, past sex offender, runs for election. You let that slide. That makes the political sphere toxic. It means victims are rendered useless. Victims are rendered worthless. We don't have that on our side. Two independent parts, both of these largely unresponded to. What do they actually respond to? A win that we don't need, but we get anyway. We get political involvement, right? We glorify people panel, and glorifying means we make the system look more glamorous, but you don't think everything will be fine. Note that this comes up only in their reply, by the way, which is way too late, but we preempt this in first. We tell you, because you know how pre prevalent issues are in the status quo, you may become more hopeful of a good future. Meaning to say, in America, if you're showing someone, this is what my first, my third speaker's POI actually meant. It wasn't just name dropping. If you're watching a movie about Morgan Freeman, a black person becoming president, it incites hope in you. It incites, it, it broadens your imagination to the extent that when it does become a reality, you know that you had a part to play. You know that the film had a part to play because it opened people up to the possibility. That's what we get on our side of the house. When you see something on a cop show where a cop makes things okay, you don't assume that the cop exists in real life, but you have faith in doing so yourself. You have faith in the system and you know that someone will do this anyway. Even for Parks and Rec panel, at the very least, the racist man is mocked. On their side, the racist man wins. So proud to have won the debate. Thank you. Thank you to all the speakers in the debate. I will now pause the recording.